caught up with the rest of the world offensively, the defense has taken a step back, and it's been a very capable defense in recent years. But during that uh, 2014 to 17 stretch, again, elite defensively, maybe not the very best because of a slight talent gap from a Michigan, Alabama, Ohio State, whomever it was at the time, but statistically as good as anyone and legitimately on the field, top five defense in the nation. Okay, I'm looking at the numbers from last year. And I'm seeing a defense that ranked in the 50s nationally. Uh, you lose Zach Allen, who uh, is an all-time uh, leader in the top 10 in tackles for loss and uh, sacks up front. And uh, your concerns and your hopes for the defense. Well, like I, like I said about the offensive line, when it comes to um, transition and, and plugging in the right guys, I think there's going to be a lot of that with the defensive side as well. Um, I feel that the defense... The defense has undergone a couple of changes. Now, I know when you when you look back 2014, 2015, even 2016, I think as well, the defense was probably uh, among the the really, especially 2015, the bet 2015's defense might be one of the best all-time defenses in college football history. Uh, when you look at what those teams did, it's virtually impossible to sustain an elite pace in the top five, just given the amount of talent that's in college football, who, what comes together at the right time. So I think when you call a team a top half or a top 50 type defense, that's still very good. And that's still a team that can win football games with its defense. Now, when you look at the defensive style, cornerbacks, new defensive backs, new linemen, yeah, there are going to be times when a, a, a defensive back gets burned on the, wrong, on the wrong play. I think you saw that last year, but you also would see guys who had experience, who knew how to play college defense, defense, and can play against college offenses, they would come out and make plays when they had to. Zach Allen was a, a monster and is now uh, heading off to the NFL, and 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 he was he's going to be very hard to replace. He followed Harold Landry and, and broke out because Landry was injured that year and became a, a household name as a result. So it's just a matter of finding the right person to to balance the the production. Guys like Wyatt Ray are virtually uh, irreplaceable, but that's where you trust the system. So when you're talking about names and, and and flicking through the names, you're looking at guys like Tana Carafa, who's a grad student defensive lineman who can play inside and shift outside. He played next to Ray Smith on the defensive line last year and big belly shirt Ray Smith, who was a good old fashioned nose tackle, was uh, was a little bit smaller and a little bit uh, stout, I guess we'll use the right term. I always loved watching him, but he was very quick What's for a guy nickname? who was very stout. I, big belly shirt, man. He was Ray Smith. Every time you saw him, the shirt rode up. It was one of my favorite guys to watch because he was a good old-fashioned nose guard. Oh, the shirts, yeah. the, whoever manufactured the shirts did not design them for the nose tackle. It was awesome. One of my favorite but football players. At one point, they weren't designed yeah. for everyone, anyone. Uh, <laughs> but, but uh, yes. Uh, the, the secondary, yep. I think uh, we talked about this a few weeks ago uh, in regards to People think of elite secondaries across college football, LSU, Ohio State, on down the line. It would surprise a lot of people that Boston College has produced near elite levels of defensive backs, and you lose some of the best uh, from last season. Hamp Cheever's just a ball hawk, uh, Lucas Dennis, and uh, somebody else that's not coming to mind, uh, Will Harris, as well in the BC secondary. So you got a bit of a, be a guessing game, I would think, in trying to replace that type of talent. You're definitely not going to replace them. I know that. Those guys were experienced. They were cohesive. They were they were phenomenal. Uh, will Harris, to this day, will graduate and graduated as probably, um, you know, I, I, I love Ray Smith. Will, will Harris, probably one of the most athletic, intense football players that I, I can honestly say was my favorite defensive back. I watched Lucas Dennis from when he was in high school. Uh, grow up in Massachusetts and and deliver uh, you know all the way up through college and watching him develop was was a, a amazing to watch um, as a local kid to, who did that too and really intelligent football players great to interview great to converse with uh, when you were talking to them on camera and, and just talking to them about football they had the smarts and they knew that if they didn't have a beat on a on a player they knew how to play in that. In in a, not necessarily a system, but they knew how to work with one another to cover and cover the right area at the right time and and create angles and be smart. And I think that's something that now we'll see 
develop with these guys who are stepping in, guys who are going to be very good. Mike Palmer uh, is a redshirt junior. He's a little bit older, played some more last year. Uh, he's going to be very good. Nolan Borgeson is a converted wide receiver. Even if he doesn't see snaps on the field as much, Nolan, he's the type of guy who knows what receivers practice and what receivers look for, so he can really help out there. Mady Alatrach, another older graduate student defensive back. Guys who are getting older can help the younger guys in that sense where guys like Brandon Sebastian, who played last year as a redshirt freshman, he'll step in as a redshirt sophomore and be able to do a little bit more develop a little bit more. Jamin Muse, same idea. Tate Haynes, same idea. Then you have your younger, younger batch, your your Jason Matries of the world, um, who's a Massachusetts product from Everett High School, uh, who can play and will learn because they just have the raw ability. So as you kind of look at the way the offensive line and some of the defensive players are, think of it the same way, which is, okay, older guys graduate, but now you have a new crop who's ready to come in. And then from the new crop, as they get older, they'll help another new crop in. And that's how you just continue to churn out the ability to win football games and be competitive is being able to maintain your depth without having to sell out for one year. You've, you're not going to have like seven guys in one year and then none the next. That's just not how I think the system is going to be set up. Dan, taking this from uh, Athlons, and this is a quote from a anonymous uh, opposing coach in the ACC on Boston College's defense in particular. They're losing a really great defense. They could make you uh, really make bad decisions throwing the ball. They hit a lot of turnovers, really physical secondary, ball hawking guys. You don't just plug and play to replace guys like that at BC. It's obvious Steve knows he's on the hot seat. He hired a lot of his guys and tried to do an overhaul they have new coordinators. The defense will look about the same with Bill Sheridan. Mike Bajakian might be able to open up a little bit more, but that's not really how they're built. Hearing that, I mean, everybody who says a, a hot seat, I think, you know, it, it's it's college football. It's a college sport. It's a wins-based industry. If you're, if, you're a, if you're a coach who can't win football games, then you're always going to be on a hot seat. In terms of what you see in, in college sports, uh, I mean, I'll say this, Boston College, knows what they do really well and they do it really well. And they're gonna and you're never gonna see a team walk into a game against Boston College and throttle them without something going wrong. And and I'll point to the Purdue game where last year where everything just kind of went wrong. They went back and, and and said we gotta fix it. There's there's not a whole lot you can learn in one particular game. And then you fast forward a few weeks and yeah they lost three games down the end of the season but at the same time they were beating Clemson and Florida State's still Florida State, and Syracuse was in the midst of a season that uh, is a once in a once in a, a decade type of season, unless you know you're Alabama and Clemson. So I think that if you watch a team and you watch the way a team plays the game, and you can find the consistency, my point has never been about wins and losses when it comes to a particular way a team plays the game. The way that I watch a team play the game, or the way that I watch a team compete is how do they do it consistently? And I think when you see Boston College, the amount of guys that they've sent to the pros in the last couple of years, the amount of guys that, that go to the combine, the fact that the recruiting is getting better it, with the advent of, of, our, of, of the new um, field fish, uh, fish field house, sorry. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see how Boston College gets to the next step. When Steve Adazio took over to get to seven wins and get into a bowl game, that was the goal. I think the goal is always to get into a bowl game because, side note, and you and I can talk about this all day, it's actually worse if you don't go to a bowl game because, what is it, 80 teams go? So you have to go You have, because of those practices. You absolutely have to get in. So to go 6-6, six and six, to go 7-5 and five at the end record, well, last year they got into the rankings, got bounced out, got back to the rankings, hosted ESPN's game day, got bounced out at the end. The next logical step, is how to make it consistent and how to now get to the national rankings, stay there, and compete for a division championship. They've proven that they can. Now you have to do it more consistently. You can't do it one week. You can't get there for once. You have to stay there once you get in there. And I think that's the next logical step, which if you watch the way this team has played, that is the trajectory that they are on. And I think don't be fooled by the name and, and thinking about five years ago, this is going to be a very competitive Boston College team that is going to make, in 12 games, 12 teams earn every yard. 
So throw out the one bad season at three and nine for Steve Adazio. He's gone seven and five or seven and six, depending on the bull effort every year. So you're thinking that a next step for him and the program is nine and three with a bull decision, of course, in play, and you finish in the top 25 and maybe on a down year from Clemson and Florida State's obviously a wild card at program to be taken advantage of while they're still down because this is not going to last with Florida State winning five games last year. Uh, taking a shot, having that opportunity similar to what they had at home against Clemson last year, uh, a chance in November to make a run at a division championship every so often. I think if you look at the national rankings and you see Clemson and Florida State, for example, or Clemson, Florida State, and Syracuse all in the top 15, and you've lost to those three teams by a combined nine points, and I'm not saying that's what it was last year because I don't have it in front of me. Well, I Florida think State was not in the top 15. No, right? but I'm I, no, but I'm just drawing off of them or NC State. Well, I think was the third team. Could be. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you look at if you look at your three if you look at three teams in your division, I'm picking three out of a hat now for this year. One being Clemson, assuming Florida State comes back, and let's just pick a third team and make it NC State. You get those three teams, and let's say they're all three nine win teams, top fifteen, and all within a game of each other or closer for the division championship. And you lose to those three teams by a combined nine to nine to fourteen points. You'd look at your record and say, well, Boston College could have gone seven and five. They weren't really a bad seven and five, were they? If that's the case. Now, in the same token, and I just think that's how good the ACC is in general. Is that upsetting? It absolutely would be because you want to see them win those games. But at the same time, the level of the eliteness in this division, the level of the eliteness in this conference, at some point, you, you got to break through that glass ceiling. But at the same time, it's all about making the competitiveness sustainable and getting BC through to the next level. I personally... I, I, you know me, I've never been one to talk about wins and losses in terms of sheared numbers. I want to see them compete with these teams that are in the top 10, in the top 15, and do it in such a way so that the, if they're going to beat you, they earned it. They didn't come in a Chestnut Hill. You didn't go in a Death Valley and, and, and post a 35 nothing loss. They had to earn every yard that they got against Boston College, and I think that's what's going to happen. So this is how I see it. Uh, I don't know what the expectations are within the administration, the athletic department, and the football program. I would think they're much higher within the football program where guys are competitive and want to win and want to win championships. But the administration is more logical and more uh, systematical with, okay, this is what we're going to invest in a football program. Th therefore, this is what we're going to expect. Me as an outsider who's been watching Boston College football since I was 10 years old and have seen the highs and the lows and the consistency actually to a certain extent of being a top 25 to top 40 program in the nation and at its best a top 10 program uh, through the Matt Ryan years and going back to the Doug Flutie uh, Heisman Trophy days, I would think that what Steve Adazio has done is pretty much what should be expected of Boston College. Uh, throw out the one aberration, the one bad year, and, and a coach at Boston College should be able to survive one, if not multiple bad years. A five and seven is not going to get a guy fired or even a three and nine at a Boston College. Uh, I don't necessarily see the ACC as being as good as you're making it out to be. I think it's arguably the worst conference in the Power Five, but I don't think there's huge separation. So when I state that, I'm not saying that it's, definitely the worst and it's by far the worst and it's horrible. I think it's about three years removed from being arguably the best. But since then, Miami's dropped. Florida State has dropped like a like a like a hammer. Uh basically it's Clemson is arguably the best program in the country, definitely the best team last year in the country. And then after that, Syracuse was the second seeded team based on record in bowl seeding last year. And I know they finished in the top 15 in the nation. They were not a top 15 team if you look at the results and who they played. And then I think you have a bunch of teams that are like 40th in the country. You've got a ton of pits in Boston College and Wake Forest and North Carolina State. They kind of masked a bad season or a, I don't want to say a bad season. They went nine and four. They masked a team that can't compete against elite teams. They got blown out by Clemson. They went and played Texas A&M in a bowl game and lost by 40 points. They really weren't that good. So 
again, I'm just trying to figure out what Boston College can expect. I know that if I ran the show and and I was in the administration or had influence over Boston College, I would think if we go seven and five most seasons, that I'm I'm happy with that. And I would hope that just by catching a little bit of luck and a scheduling quirk and then developing a team that every four years or so we we catch a senior laden team that's really strong. Yes, we can make a run for it, even if we don't get it done, especially considering Clemson is the gold standard in college football and Florida State very recently has been near the gold standard of college football. We can't expect to win the division, but hey, if we're playing games in November, we have a chance to win it. Let's say we finish 10 and two or nine and three every four or five years, seven and five most of the time, we can put up with a four and eight or five and seven every five or six years. That's about what I'm expecting out of my Boston College football team. I think that this Boston College program uh, had to go through a complete rebuild. Uh, that'll be the first thing that I that I will admit. I think uh, coming out of coming into the ACC and and then the explosion into the arms race. I think Boston College uh, needed to needed to finally have some of those things that the, the nice things that, that other schools have, and I think they finally have it. Until you started to get that, it would make practice, it would make competing, it would make development of your players a lot difficult or a lot a little bit more difficult than you would get at other schools. Now I think look when you look at it, when you look on paper and this is one of the things that I'm most proud of to be associated with Boston College when I when I talk about this too is that it's not going to be the amassing of the four stars and the five stars. They do get them and they do get talent, but it is always going to be a development laden program. And the fact that they've put in that fish field house and that they've put in some of the development areas and, and the fact that I've, I've I've been able to walk in there and see and see some of the scrimmages and the turf field with the ability to do uh, instant replay and, and speakers and, you know, simulate some of those the sound that wasn't always like that, which I know a lot of people might hear that and say, who doesn't have that? Well, until the fish field house, you weren't you weren't practicing indoors. And your Boston College, you, you really need to practice indoors. I mean, at times, I mean, the, you need to train indoors. Uh, you have a grass field and a turf field and, and having a football specific weight room and football de uh, development. That's all things that they, they were able to enhance. Maybe they had it, maybe they didn't have it, but they were able to enhance it and make sure moving forward that they did. As that happens, your recruitment is going to get more competitive and and it certainly has. I, I think you're seeing guys like Finn Durstein, who's a, who's an offensive lineman who committed to BC. He's a very good offensive line recruit. He's coming to Boston College. Guys like Sam Johnson, who's a quarterback who will likely back up uh, Anthony Brown in some capacity this year. He's a very good quarterback recruit who commits to Boston College. So you're bringing in guys selling the development angle but now you're getting a little bit better in the recruitment. You're going to see Boston College, maybe the name, again, doesn't jump off the paper when you think of the fact that you have a, a, a program in the Northeast in New England, which competes for, you know, people say competes for airtime opposite the, the Patriots and the Celtics and the Bruins and not this year. Uh, the Boston Red Sox, but they usually have to compete in October and November with the Boston Red Sox. But, you know, the it's it's really exciting to see what's happening because Boston College, which has always had its little niche in college football, has taken the steps to start to compete with some of the other teams and start to make little inlets. Are they going to recruit the same athletes as them? Well, they never were. And I don't think they ever, they're ever going to. That's not what Boston College is all about. And that's not you know, the amassing of the talent. It's always going to be different with Boston College. But to have your system know that your system can work and develop those players to get to that next level, to me, is one of the most exciting things. Maybe not for 2018, maybe it wasn't for 2017, but to even look ahead to 2021 and 2022 and to see the trajectory that BC is on, I think there could be some really special things brewing. And if people don't want to pay attention to Boston College yet, they'll be pleasantly surprised when BC shows up on that map for them. So I'm going to put a caveat on what I just said that'll close my complete synopsis of, of my Boston College take, and that's division placement. That is a huge factor in all this. So Clemson's here. They're number one. They're typically top five in the nation for the last five years. Florida State was there. They've dropped off considerably. They can get back there like that. They are a top 10 national program and even maybe better than that and have been just in the last five years. 
And then you've got this mess of teams, included Miami, that has the potential to be up there and has at different times. But basically, Boston College, by the unfortunate aspect of being thrown in the Atlantic Division versus the Coastal Division. Now, my take on what I just stated in regards to record projections and expectations for competing for championships would be far different if you would have been thrown in the other division where you have a Miami program that recruits top 15 talent, but they seemingly never can develop it to play at that level. So they're, they are playing down into the masses. And then you got this mass of programs that basically are somewhere between 25 and 50 in the nation. And they're, they're interchangeable. Practically Georgia tech Pitt, Duke, they take turns winning the division and Virginia Tech's fallen into that category. Boston College could be right in the fray of that mix and could competing for championships in the other division where they wouldn't have to run into Clemson and Florida State and NC State to a certain extent on a regular basis. Pitt won that division going seven and seven last year. You know, it, it reminds me of uh, was it the old American League in the in the mid 2000s or the early 2000s? For all we know, the Toronto Blue Jays probably could have been the third best team in Major League Baseball, but they were behind the Red Sox and the Yankees. Yep. There was a time in which I looked at that situation and thought, when will Tampa Bay ever make the playoffs? This will never happen. Well, they proved me wrong a few years later, but uh, yeah, the Yankees and the Red Sox had a stranglehold on the entire American League for a span of five to seven years. Absolutely. Oh, don't want to talk about what's going on in the division right now, but that's that's beside the point. Summer no, 2019 it's good to have is, wealth, Dan. It's good to have yeah. a wealth spread across the map and the geography of the entire nation. I know you're stuck there in the Northeast, but uh, we we like to see see other teams compete. Is, is there is there life outside of Boston? I don't know. I've, I think I left. I didn't leave the area code until I was until I was 26. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dan, it's uh, good chatting with you, getting the full realm, uh, the full perspective on uh, BC personnel. Hey, it's, uh, you know what, it's, it's football season, the ACC kickoff's coming up, and uh, feels good to, to shake off the ring rust and get back to it. I can't wait to see what's going to happen this year all around college football. It's so great.